thanks everybody for being here. Thank you to Chiara from Kaufman Repetto, co-owner of the gallery. Thank you to Giovanna Amadasi from Hangar Bicocca. Thank you to Barbara Casavecchia, a fellow um, publishing person, magazine person, and uh, uh, also lecturer at the Brera Academy. And thank you to Alessandro Gabottini, who's the new director of the art fair in Milan, Mi Art. Um, so it's kind of uh, um, weird that we're gonna be talking about ourselves, basically. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think when Mark Spiegler approached me and asked uh, if uh, we wanted to have a talk about Milan, he was really, really um, curious about why now all of a sudden, since he knows the city quite well and it's been coming for years, but now why all of a sudden people are talking about it as if it was a very exotic new discovery and new obsession as a destination. So we said, okay, we're gonna ask different people who are active in Milan and who also have a view from the outside because I've been working internationally and have been in contact with other you know, publics. Why, in your opinion, all of a sudden, now the New York Times says that Milan is the number one destination to visit in 2015, and I guess that was also because of the World Expo. But now uh, it's making pieces about uh, how new contemporary art venues put Milan on the art map. And uh, so perhaps, Chiara, we could start with you, because you're, you live in New York, you're, you're from Milan, you've been running a gallery for a decade, I guess, in Milan before you know, opening the, uh, the other venue in New York, do people come to you and they say, oh, you know, what's going on there? I, uh, it's quite amazing, I have to say. Uh, I mean, I've never been speaking about Milano as much as in the last uh, couple of years. I mean, it almost feels like Milano didn't exist on the art map before. Uh, not didn't exist, but abroad there was really a perception that you know, it was not the main art city, even though there's a very strong presence of gallery and not only, and we're gonna, you know, explore this a little bit later. So definitely, you know, I, I hear a lot of comments of people really surprised about, you know, the beauty of Milano, how active it is and how many, you know, new venue are opening and, and are active. And there was a precedent. When I Am Love, the movie with Tilda Swinton, uh, was released, I think that was, exactly. I guess, a conversation starter for many people who didn't know that side of Milan or they didn't even suspect how elegant and classy and uh, surreal could have been. Um, but of course, now it's much more serious, I guess. No? Yeah. There is yeah. substance to the... Chatter. In fact, I think that, you know, it also matters the fact that probably the perception of people towards, for example, the kind of architecture we have in Milano is probably different. I mean, Italy used to be perceived as the, you know, the city of, uh, you know, where our history is so strong and Renaissance um, is, is, it was the period that would identify our cities. And then, you know, all of a sudden there's a this huge attention to modernism. I also think that we could probably appreciate more, you know, the, the, the aesthetics that were maybe connected to a historical period that was, you know, not like a good period because, you know, the 30s, the 40s right. produced a lot of great architecture, but there was also, you know, a sort of uh, cultural resistance to that kind of aesthetic. And so I also think it's in the eyes of the people that see the city in a different way. But definitely, you know, the attention on Milano is, is high right now, yeah. And uh, I think you are very much involved with this new hype of attention, since you work uh, in what is possibly the biggest exhibition space in Europe at the moment, in terms of square footage per exhibition, for sure. Uh, what is your view from the hunger? Uh, well, the view from the hangar is uh, a very special point of view since actually we realized when uh, Pirelli decided to relaunch the space uh, four years ago with a new artistic direction and really with a new project of transforming what was a space for exhibitions in a real institution. Uh, we, we, we knew there was a public out there for us, but 
uh, we really didn't expect this much of affection, presence, and participation of the public. Of course, we had in mind, uh, we had in mind uh, a precise idea when we decided to, uh, to re in a way, reopen the space and rethink of a project that actually is there since 2004 with Kiefer uh, Towers, uh, Seven Heavenly Palaces, but the idea was really to respond to a request of culture that, of course, anyone who has lived and worked in Milano, like I did uh, uh, as an independent, as a professional, knew there was. So, uh, of course, Milan, everybody knows that Milan is a city of design, of fashion, and in a way, I, we always had the feeling that there was a uh, a public that was much more ahead of what the actual cultural offer from the public institution was. So uh, actually in these four years, uh, what we saw, it was a, first of all a great participation and enthusiasm and really affection, I would use this word, from the public in Milan. And little by little, but now going faster and faster, a great attention from uh, international public. It happens almost every week and during the art fair almost every day that... Uh, you have VIPs coming. Uh, VIPs or even better, like groups of uh, museums, uh, uh, passionate people from, from the art world all, all over the world that come to see us. So I think this, uh, this is really uh, something new. This is really something happening since I would say a couple of years that of course, I guess it's caused both by the international uh, recognition that our institution is starting to have, but also because the city is changing and the perception of the city from the international art world has really improved very much. Yeah, I think museum groups are very much a game changer somehow in terms of like... Yeah, they're definitely... They're definitely... definitely and typically they, they go to art fairs or they go to museums. So yeah, they travel like for kind of specific events, like uh, big events. And of course, they decide to arrive in a city in a very specific moment of the year. But I think that what is happening now in Milan, and it's interesting that this panel uh, you have like you, Chiara, working for a commercial gallery, uh, <clears throat> Giovanna working for a private institution, Stefano working for a magazine, and you, like uh, Barbara, working both as independent curator and also as a writer. So we all, and I'm working for an art fair. So these are the elements that they make Milan what it is now. People that each, in it, each one in its own field has been working really hard, as we were talking before, for the last 15 years, because things, I mean, it's, it's funny because the title is all of a sudden uh, interrogation point, and I would say all of a sudden exclamation point, because we've all been working really hard, and now, of course, all the things get together and create a sort of a landscape that the people, they can appreciate. Of course, we needed like some bigger event on a scale of event to activate international attention on us. And so, yeah. of course, like, I mean, the Anger Bicocca, the Fondazione Prada, the Fondazione Trussardi, and Miart, they acted as activator of something. But what I like about, and you were talking about the beauty of Milan, because despite the fact that when the people, they they hear talking about Milan, they think that it is a sort of an industrial ugly city. And it's actually beautiful because you arrive by train and you get into this wonderful grand station. You yeah. get out and you see like one of the masterpieces of modernism, which is the Pirelli skyscraper by Gio Ponti. And you start learning that you will have to get used to a different kind of beauty. I mean, I'm not a Milanese, I moved there in 2001, and it took me like a few years to start learning and to start understanding what is the beauty in Milan. But I also think that, you know, like you mentioned the Anger Bicocca, the Fondazione Parada, where, as you were saying, like size matter in terms yes. of scale. But Milan is also a city where you can get a very intimate relationship with art because you walk into the Casa Boschi di Stefano which is a 
kind of a small museum hosted in a private apartment, you walk into the living room and you see you're surrounded by something like 20 Lucio Fontana, which is incredible. So like, I think that what is happening now is the natural consequence of something that has been done very specifically with a lot of professionals by the people that has been working on the commercial galleries, the private institutions, the publishing houses. And now what we are w w seeing is something that is like uh, the reactivation of something that I think belongs to the history of the city because uh, you know, Milan has, is the, the city of futurism, the history yeah. of Lucio Fontana, Piero Manzoni, even one of the greatest artists of Arte Povera, Luciano Fabro, was from Milan. So it's, we are now witnessing something that belongs to, uh, to something that is not, it's not a new destination. It's like a, a destination that needed to welcome like the international audience on that scale. Barbara, do you think it's really changed? I, well, I think I agree with you. It, it's a time of harvesting somehow, because uh, no, it's, it's really a positive feeling, but I think what you are saying, uh, that old institution, the private sector, the publishing house, and, and whatever, I mean, uh, there is also a, a significant number of schools, for instance, in Milan. I mean, there's the Arts Academy, where I teach, but there's also a private academy, which is NABA. There are the design schools, there are the university, the architectural schools. I mean, um, a number of people who are naturally driven to a sort of an idea of what's contemporary. And of course, I mean, there is part of the TV and film industry and there's also the design sector, which is huge, and the fashion. And I mean, you could kind of make it bigger and bigger. But it's also, I think, that um, out of a lot of work and I think goodwill as well, uh, a lot of effort has been put into kind of cultivating a public. That's what I mean by it, it's a time of harvest, because for many years the projects that were presented and offered to the city, I mean, by many foundations were totally for free. I mean, Anger still is for free. Uh, yeah. Trussardi almost always for free, unless, I mean, it was in collaboration with the municipality and so a number of people for many years had the possibility of, of accessing uh, very huge projects of all sides. I mean, urban projects, private exhibitions, and also the fact that little by little, sometimes, I mean, as the city hadn't been that much somehow inhabited by contemporary art for, for years, there were so many locations that were fascinating and very easy to become uh, sort of suddenly the perfect scenario for who's whose installation or secret discovery or anything. So I think many people got to know their own city in, in a different way. And that was very healthy yeah. and helpful for younger generation. And I really think it's been a kind of joint group effort because I'm not saying it out of rhetorical, but we're all friends. <laughs> We've known each other a long way back and it's been kind of a shared, yeah, also enthusiasm about the need of wanting something there and just trying to work in that direction. So whether this is all entirely new for us, no. I mean, no. <laughs> we've been on the field for many years. Uh, whether this is finally but it, but kind of like seen and recognized, it, it's, it's a very good feeling. Um, yeah, but didn't you have the feeling that, for instance, when Prada opening, it was kind of like beyond your wildest dreams? That like you, you d really didn't hope for that to be so good, and, and it was, and you know, because then you, you meet people coming to the openings because some other artists are in their show, and they're like really, okay, this is serious. Like y you can feel it in their face, on their face, like th they're curious, but then they're taking stock of it, and they're like, and then they go to the hangar, and like it's unbelievable in the sense they cannot believe it, like it's, it's totally unexpected. It wasn't factored in, in the experience of going to Milan. I think now there is something I, that I is... I think, I mean, literally is kind of step by step. Many things started to grow and finally reached, I don't know, it's, it's the coming of age also. 
institutions yeah. that have been building themselves also as institutions. I mean, and institutions are made of people. There are good curators who are at working. There are good people doing the research for exhibitions. There are people who are in charge for reasonable projects within even public institution, <laughs> and I say even because I mean maybe the public sector it's not the strongest in Milan, but yeah. um, and all, all of general. that has, has created uh, a sort of development which now has kind of taken very physically and visibly space and new spaces and new architectures around the city. But I think the these structures were there even before you could actually see them. In fact, if I can. You know, I agree about the fact that it was really a teamwork. Then I think Milano grew up mostly probably for private initiatives, we have to say. I mean, maybe if anything, the public sphere hasn't been as, you know, um, I think hasn't valued culture as much as the private, like Prada or Pirelli with Angar Bicocca. And I have to say that one thing that, for example, you know, created a lot of energy in town was the fair, Miart, that for a period became, it was only pretty much modern art, historical art, and now with the comeback of the contemporary, you know, it really created a synergy in town. I mean, first of all, I have to say, Miart was strongly wanted by gallerists because we felt that there was really a request, you know, people were more and more interested in Milano, there were realities like the hangar, and, and we felt that, you know, people wanted to come to Milano, needed a reason to come to Milano. They needed a reason. They wanted a reason. So, you know, as dealers, we realized there was an opening and like a, a possibility to discuss with the owner of the fair. And, you know, I have to say that, funny enough, the city responded a lot to the fair, even though Milano is not, for example, Miami, which is probably a city where, you know, really the fair brought a lot of the art, art system that is there now. We had an art system, but I think it wasn't working in synergy very much. And I think that through also a fair, the city started reacting to it and there were, you know, venues, uh, shows, uh, the gallery started doing, you know, openings together. So you could really see how, you know, the elements were there already, like you guys were saying, but we needed something too. And, and I think that in that sense, the fair, fair did a lot. And now, you know, slowly, year after year, during my art, many, actors are joining that week, uh, which yeah. is really becoming a super alive moment for the city. Like, what I always say to like everybody is because like they, the people, they think that for example, we as a fair, we have the capacity to make things happen. And I always say, look, like, I mean, what we do is actually to put together the things that they would have to happen any, any way. Like we create a calendar, we create a platform for, to present, like we created something that to showcase something Fly that, people over. Yeah, yeah, but the, of course, I mean, we are, we are here because of a fair. We are here in, and the, the, the museums, they put up the best shows, like uh, the, the collections are, you know, showing what they have. But the thing is that like what we can do, we can do that, because there is a, a landscape of things. We just need to create a calendar around them. So what I always say is that we can do that now to create this platform to showcase what we have as a city because these people are working like for 365 years, days a year. So it's not that they're just like uh, coming up with a project like uh, for that specific week. They're just like they, slowly, the same thing that you were saying has been like working in order to create an audience. And this audience is now like, has been, you know, like so well trained that is a very sophisticated uh, audience for, for contemporary culture, which I also think um, it's uh, something that is distinctive of Milan, which is our kind of history is a history of modernity. So like you don't walk in the city and you have this feeling that you're breathing centuries, you're breathing something that our, yeah, our history is a history that started, you know, with futurism or it started with like in the 60s and in the 50s and in the 40s and in the 30s with certain architecture and design. So like uh, uh, you can 
breathe this very specific thing and um and I think that yeah the fear played and now and I'm not saying just because I'm like now working as as director for for my first year in this fair but actually like it created that platform to make sure that everything was visible at the same time but he couldn't do that if you didn't wouldn't have these people like really doing their things through the whole year I think that it's also a matter of, of vision, really. A vision that, uh, I mean, in a way, Milan kept inside itself this vision very, um, mm, uh, in, in many, many people who worked there. And all of a sudden, maybe also thanks of big institution, the fair, like uh, suddenly this vision became public in a way. So what you say that size matter, it is actually a fact because we had an, uh, uh, in a way, a, an image of our city that was never represented, never got a, really a shape that was visible from outside. And now, all of a sudden, because of the fair, because of Hangar uh, Bicò uh, Capirelli, because of Fondazione Prada, I perfectly understand what you mean. Seeing ourselves through those moments, they were really, you know, what struck me in the beginning at Hangar Bicocca was that people came and say, oh, it's like not being in Milan. Can I just interrupt you? What struck me the most about Hangar Bicocca is when you announced your two years program, or maybe over three years. Three years, actually. Three years of exhibition uh, announced with dates. It's unprecedented in Italy. Yeah, it never happened. This is, of course, thanks uh, to a chain of, of, of decision that... No public museum would even dream of like, being so ambitious. So. But yeah, yeah, the word ambition is also correct. I mean, suddenly we realized that Milan, well, deserved an ambition that was international. And still, every day when we work at Angar Bicocca, we tell ourselves that everything everything we, we make, we, everything, every decision we take must be up to the standards of an international institution, which actually we are, because Can Milan... Can you share some visitors' numbers? Uh, visitors? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're around, we, it, it depends from year to year, but we are, uh, now the Carson Order exhibition had 60,000 visitors since its opening, which means around 6,000 every, every weekend, every week. And last year we had 100, uh, 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 150,000 visitors, which for a space that it's not in the center of the city, and it's, it has a sometimes very challenging also programs because we're not always, you know, it, we, we don't... You do half and half, no? We do half and half, yes. Uh, Vicente uh, Vicentes, uh, is very capable of maintaining a very high level, but also alternating more, let's say, popular exhibition with really challenging. Uh, I remember, I mean, the first choice he made, the first exhibition he curated when he was appointed director was Dieter Roth, which is not an easy artist at all. And that exhibition, really? I remember entering this <laughs> I space. I think they know him in Basel. <laughs> yeah. I, I entered the space and suddenly I remember the f the, before the opening of the exhibition and I realized when I saw the exhibition finished that we were a big international institution because that show you couldn't see. I mean, I would just quickly mention, I mean, also the work of a, an amazing curator you had, Andrea Lissoni, which went from the Hangar Bicocca to Tate in London. I mean, just to <laughs> give a possible size of how yeah. finally, I mean, things are perceived in a different way. I mean, you could actually go from a big institution in Milan to one of the biggest in Europe. You can go to because of the an experience art fair, to a museum you in built and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Or yeah, Vincenzo De Bellis who went from the direction of Mi Arte to Walker Art Center. So I think it's also expanding in terms of how the connections are growing and how many people are just yes, moving out, but also kind of recreating links with what's within the city and how the things are um, discussed and put together. I mean I think we can all remember each other in really tiny, small contexts or <laughs> independent projects or no budget publications or <laughs> tiny institutions and so on. I mean, <coughs> it's just been going. And it's also like true, like the opposite, because then you have a 
the, like a curator, an international curator like Massimiliano Gioni, that lives in New York, works for the new museum, but every like twice a year brings like his vision into the projects of the Fondazione Trussardi, which I mean I don't know if all of you are familiar with the program of the Fondazione Trussardi, but they don't have a location, they don't have an exhibition space. Every time and twice a year they develop like a project with an international artist or a group show in a different historical location of Milan, which is um, a sort of a virus, an institutional virus that infiltrates the um, existing structure of the city and making great, wonderful projects. Like, for example, I mean, now, because I just came back from the Bayer and I remember the Fishley and Weiss exhibition that they staged that was incredible, at yeah. the Palazzo Litta, which was super fascinating because you can contextualize great contemporary art in a great historical location. So it's also true that you know, people then having an international career, an international platform, they still decide to have Milan as uh, as their working ground, like, and you have, you know, Germano Celland is the same, Francesco Bonami is the same, you know, like, uh, all these people that they are based in Milan or that they, they do international, but they, for many reasons, decided also to make Milan as their main platform. Well, I think that Massimiliano had a sort of really good point when he started doing the project. It's kind of proving that you didn't need a big museum to do a big program or to be ambitious and create occasions for bringing great art to the city because the absence of a public art museum has been discussed in Milan for decades and it's not happening uh, but maybe it will happen or eventually it might not happen but it, it's at the moment discussion is kind of out of radar but still I mean the fact that for instance, Fondazione Trussardi started to create so many things despite the absence of a physical venue, injected, I think, a lot of energy within. This is like you were talking scene. about like Vincenzo De Belli who founded together with his wife People that now performs, it's an, an, an individual initiative, non-profit initiative that now performs the function of the Kunsthalle of the Kunstverein because we don't have like those kind of middle range institutions like where you can actually have a young international or Italian artist experimenting for the first time in his career with something new on a larger scale. And that was a non-profit space that ended up in a few years performing the function of a frack or a Kunstverein. If I can yeah. add something about the Fondazione Trussardi, I think that really, I mean, they were really smart capturing the nature of the city. I feel that, you know, Milano unravels, you know, you have to discover it. I mean, everybody says that I, the beauty of Milano, for example, our courtyard, and most of the time the doors are shut. closed, are shut. Uh, I always say it's a sock that you have to, you know, pull upside down, maybe not the best metaphor, but... Um, so I really think they, 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 they got it because every, for us Milanese to go to the Fondazione Trussardi show and see this incredible space that were around the corner that we had never visited before it was fantastic and, and, and I guess... Huge crowds were also there. Like yeah, huge These crowds. exhibitions, like what should be pointed out because then maybe they're not vanity projects. I mean, they, they, like we said that time and again, but that they work. I, I mean, I think it's been proven that like if you do it, it works, but nobody has been doing it. Or maybe like everybody was working towards making it happening. But no, I think that um, even the invisible small independent spaces, which of, I mean, are not so much represented here and you might never heard of, but they had a, an important role. I mean, there are some small or bigger institution, but there's one of the biggest video archives in Milan of, of Italian art, which is called Kerov, and it's been there for over 20 years. And um, I think everything together with uh, joint efforts kind of put together the sort of also possibility of, of having a career or thinking in terms of trying out in the first person what you could do. I mean, 
I started at Flash Art, which was also another really important presence in, in the city Absolutely. scene. Uh, and now I just saw their last issue. They have, I mean, Gasconade, which is also an artist collective from Milan, which is now writing their own history in, in terms of retelling the little individual stories or not so individual. But anyway, it's again about the city and what it means to have kind of grown up there and developed your own vision and works and studying there and, and meeting uh, a number of experiences. So, um, yes. And I think it's making more and more sense if you're a young artist to stay in Milan. Can we say that? Because it's, it's you know, it's been pretty depressing for so long uh, to be there. And, uh, and now you mentioned Gascony, there, there are other you know, spaces that opened and like, there is a sense of a small community, I think, growing. That it was always there, but now you know, they're, they're, the, the spectrum is more covered. No, I, I, yeah. I teach at the Arts Academy and I'm really happy to see some of the ex-students to open spaces like, I don't know, Tile, Armada. I could mean, I mean, it's easy to name quite a few, but now you see that the energy is there. There's even this program when all the artists open their studios for an entire week. So you can literally see a hundred and over a hundred studios all over the place and you didn't even realize that there were so many living there and of all generations because I think that's important too. It's not only a city where you have the super young or sort of up and coming, you have many different generations and, and layers of art history kind of getting in touch with each other on a sort of yeah. uh, regular basis. So, uh, and you can yeah. see exhibitions at Christian Stein that are absolutely oh, yeah. like out of this world. Um, the, the Christian Stein has this warehouse, like the storage space in Pero, just on the outskirts of Binan, that it's also, I think, one of the biggest gallery spaces. Uh, and they, they've been mounting a few uh, retrospective uh, shows from Boetti to Fabio to Paladino just now that are really, they're, yeah, they're irreplaceable, yeah. they're museum pieces, yeah. Oh, but it's true what, what we would, I've been thinking about it and recently and I've been thinking that really the only thing that now Milan is really missing is of course I mean the public institution because we can't you know we can't avoid thinking about the, the function of the public institution which is the collective history the collective memory and the collection but I've been thinking about this uh, need that now Milan has to get back the younger artists that they left in the past few years. Um, I mean, of course, you know, there was the moment of Berlin and everybody wanted to go to Berlin. Then we had Brussels and many people going to Brussels, which are fantastic cities. But then, like, when you talk with young emerging galleries, you start having the feeling that one of the main problems start becoming like, where should I live? And I don't know where and why, basically. So it's like as if like if it, for the past few years, they kind of had that sort of existential and professional need to move somewhere else, even if, if you didn't know. There's also an economical <laughs> factor. Because <to> <laughs> Milan, it's, it's not a sort of easiest city where to live in if you're a young person. I mean, it's quite demanding. So the reasons yeah, I mean, why... It's also true that many moved to London, which is not more cheap. I think Berlin was one of the drives also yeah, because Berlin, of the like possibility a, of affording yeah. studio space yeah. and, and, and different conditions. But yeah. it's, it, that, that's one of the reasons why yeah. it was, it's not the only one, but it no, no. was definitely not the cheapest city in Italy. But, but now I think that it's like uh, there is, um, we are at the beginning of something that is changing, that it, which is like getting back the artist, or at least having young artists, like for example, still studying at the academy, which should, they, and they don't have the feeling that they have to leave to make something good with their work, that they can actually stay. But we have to work on creating structures for that, because that is missing. Is missing, like, you know, for example, a stable. They need shows. They need they shows. They need shows. They need, like, a, like a sort of a really stable residency program also to attract foreign artists like international artists to come and stay in Milan like for example this little 
this little thing that is happening now at the Fonderia Battaglia, which is this place, it's a foundry. Uh, you go there, it's a fantastic place because they've been like, for example, doing the trees of Penone for many, many years. And now they started like this, uh, it's the first edition of a prize for uh, emerging international artists that they invite to develop something because of course, I mean, they're really smart. They want to get new energy, new ideas on how to work with bronze. And of course, I mean, which is also like a kind of a fashionable material now. Like you have a lot of international artists working with bronze and, and they awarded like last week or to like, a, who got the prize, Nicolas Deschaies or? Yeah, I don't like, know. Yeah, it's an artist, it is an artist from London working with Stuart Shave. And I think it's a, it's a smart way to bring back people, you know, wanting to stay. No, I mean, for, but this is what I think it's missing, like a stable structure to, um, to make sure that the young artists, they don't have that need to leave. Because now I think that many of them, they actually don't want to leave. They actually want to stay. Um, they're happy to stay because, I mean, of course, the things are happening. Yeah, we I just have to make sure that. Uh, pretty nice place, you know, in the end. It is a beautiful <laughs> place. It is, but I have an um, that's, that's example. A, that's something serious, you know, like. Right. Because, uh, but from, from our point of view, the fact that we're placed really at the border of Milan, we're trying to work hard on, on, on the neighborhood. We're starting project with the university really to reevaluate that. You know, that part of the city which is between Milan, we're really at the border of Milan, we're closer to Sesto San Giovanni. Sesto San Giovanni, it's a former industrial, I mean, we are a former industrial space. And Sesto San Giovanni, it's really a working, former working class place, which now has a very high quality of life and much lower prices. So, and we're starting to hear uh, artists that have uh, their studios in, in in Greco, for instance, Greco. It's a, it's an old popular yeah. uh, neighborhood which is very nice, and it's a small uh, former factory. The factory that would work around the big factories like Pirelli, like Breda, and now they're starting. So there is something happening, I think, in the outskirts of the city, which oh. makes it possible to to oh. artists to to base themselves there. And we're really trying to do like small studio visits with our staff to the neighborhoods, uh, to but neighbor artists, so. Also the other big institutions are out of the city center. I mean, yeah. this is quite obvious in terms of having available space for building new venues. But I also think it's, it's interesting in terms of how the city is much bigger than what you perceive if you only go to the right. center center. I mean, the energy of Milan has always been coming also from the fact, I mean, you, you said before you, you're a post-industrial space, we are a post-industrial town. Uh, <laughs> right. I, would, I wouldn't mind a gallery district. Can I just be honest? Mm -hmm. That would be nice, I think. I, if, you, if you weren't so inconveniently um, scattered. We, we are, we are. And I have to say, it's a, it's a job to go visit galleries in Milano. I have to say, um, no park, some are in the center and they're difficult to reach. And there's not really, I mean, there is an area, in fact, in the north uh, of Milano called Lambrate, where a, a number of galleries are. It didn't develop as much as probably we no. thought, also because because why? The area didn't develop. I think that, that there was not like uh, a real development around the galleries, but maybe because... But now, for instance, it's one of the biggest area for the design, design exhibition. Exactly, so exactly. if you happen to go to Milan, you'd probably end up in, in that area and where on, all exactly. the galleries are as well. So yeah. And on the other side, mm -hmm. you know, again, Milano is a city that you have to conquer a little bit. You have to maybe, again, do a little bit more of homework. I mean, I'm not saying I would like a gallery district, obviously, as a dealer. But there are things that I like, for example, of being a little bit on my own as a gallery myself, because then I know that people come to spend time at the gallery. I mean, I really see the difference. My space in New York is in Chelsea, where people, you know, uh, go one gallery to the other and they're really... I don't think we would ever get to that point. No, I don't <laughs> think there's any risk of that, but uh, the quality of the visits of the gallery are radically different. I mean, Milano, we really spend the time, people come to, you know, have an experience that it is that one experience. And, and in New York, you know, sometimes people would spend 
five seconds in, in, in the thing they've seen the thing because there's that idea I want to see as much as possible. We have a very good quality, you know, right. kind of visitors, kind of visits in, in the gallery. Do you have of collectors that. from the city, young generation collectors? Yeah, and I have to say, I mean, at least for our experience, uh, it kind of kept the market, speaking of, about pure market, um, pretty steady and stable, even in years of big credit crunch, you know, like from 2008 on, I, I'm not saying, I mean, maybe young collectors don't buy for like big amount of money, but there was this really, like also in that sense, I'm saying, you feel that, you know, there's a thirst and there is a whole new generation of collector that, you know, if, even in their early 30s that are being very active and it's really refreshing to see. I mean, I don't know really, at a certain point we, we were even surprised about the, the, the whole, and, and people that maybe don't have that huge amount of money but still want to spend, you know, something yeah. for, for art is yeah, refreshing. Like, I think that is also like very distinctive of Italy in general. And uh, one, I, was, I was one day talking with Ettore Spalletti, who is um, an artist, he's now in his 70s. And if you didn't go, I would rather, really recommend you to go and see his booth here uh, at Lia Roma, which has this fantastic immersive installation of paintings. And one day he was telling me, you know, like, the Italians, they are used to have pictures on the wall. Even if it's a really bad pictures that you've bought at the flea market, but we are not used to have like empty walls and like nice furniture. We have that idea. So the minute that you have just a little money, even as a young couple who is making like, and has very little money, the first thing that you think is, what can I buy in terms of art? Maybe I can afford a young artist for a few thousand euros, but I will buy. And in fact, you always find something in the houses, like, you know, it's a, we even had like auctions on TV, so like, which is, you know. So let's hope that now young collectors want to sponsor residencies for younger artists. Yeah. And give them a chance to come and do something. It'd be super helpful, actually. But you know, but I have a... I'm sorry, Kara. I have to ask if there are any questions yeah. for us. And if they're not, you may continue. <laughs> I was just saying very quickly, I have an example, I have an artist that represented, that moved to Milano, he was based somewhere else, and opened a studio close to Angar Bicocca, in fact, where he also lives, he managed to do like a bit of a, you know, home and studio accommodation. There are so many people that want to visit his studio, because we don't have so many artists in town, and when an artist is in town, and they find out that there's, because artist studios are the most beautiful place, I mean, for us it's the best time, you know, we can have you really enter into the intimacy of the work of an artist. So yeah, I think this is another proof that, you know, there's really a thirst, you know, that, that somehow uh, created, generated all these, you know, other things that are coming up in Milano. So people are really, you know, ready and, and hungry to have a chance to see these kind of things. So hope more artists are going to come. Good. Any Shall we wrap it up, or anybody has anything else to say as a coda? No, very, very quickly. I mean, as much as I'd hope to see more residencies or exchange program being developed, and of course, I think they would develop much more strongly if there were public institutions around the possibility of developing such projects. I really hope, I mean, or would be happy to call for the possibility of having a stronger public presence in terms of creating a collection that could help people to realize that there's been a long story there. And you can actually go from the 60s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s and so on. I mean, so that you can reconstruct how from one generation of artists to the following one, a certain discourse, aesthetics, uh, attitude has been kind of passed on and, and developed, because I think that's also very strongly part of the DNA of the city. But it'd be nice to see it kind of yeah. re retold by artworks. I would like to have the pack back and work, because that would be the most beautiful Constanze. <laughs> Question here. Um, thank you, everyone, for an incredibly interesting. My name is Tayeb. I am from San Francisco, filmmaker. Um, 
would you please just tell us a little bit about the performance art uh, vibe in Milan and uh, experimental film or contemporary films? Is there any movement there for uh, performance art? And who's taken that on? I can think of a few artists who are doing performances. I wouldn't be able to say whether it's a movement or not, but and also about experimental films, for instance. Uh, I mean, there are amazing filmmakers which are being rediscovered recently, like, I don't know, Jervan Janikian and Angela Ricciluki, who just had a huge retrospective at Pompidou. And they're not young filmmakers at all. They're in their 70s. But, uh, and Milan has always had a very good uh, cinema school. Uh, very strong on the documentary side. We have uh, fairly amazing directors like Alina Marazzi that I can think of, for instance. Um, there is a scene there. Uh, I, I wouldn't define Milan as the place for contemporary art, but I can, I mean, just name them. There are so many who work in that direction. I mean, even really young artists like Beatrice Marchi or, or, or others I've seen recently using the, the spoken word or sort of word and, 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 and movement and even singing <laughs> as part of the, uh, their own production. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's really that easy to articulate at the moment if there's a movement from Milan, but I, I know from the sort of unseen below the surface that there are many things happening and hopefully they will grow within the next few years. I think that we should mention, I mean, talking about performing arts, like, for example, this festival, which is called Lu uh, Uovo Performing Arts Festival, which has been for the past maybe eight years, really bringing to Milan, I mean, like the best, um, more experimental artists working with performing arts. You name them, like from Xavier Leroy to Tino Siegel, even like people that I was not aware of because I'm not really into this field. And I think that, that they really made an incredible job. Um, I mean, of course, you have more established, uh, like, for example, the Teatro Streller, which always bring very established production of contemporary theater. Maybe, like, what is not really developed, like, it's a place for um, moving image. You know, like you, you don't have like something like if you're in London, you want to go to the ICA and right. see the most radical. Although in the middle of the Prada Foundation, there is a cinema. There is a right cinema in the middle of that like a, Wonderland sort of campus. There is a cinema. They now they just did this like a uh, festival curated by Quaron, um, uh, if I'm not wrong. I mean, they, yeah, they, they do, I think. they're really sensitive towards moving images, but uh, it's something maybe like really new. It's of course, I mean, like a place where you can go and see like the latest production that has been like screened at film festival or independent film festival, like you have maybe a little bit less or maybe I'm not aware of. I mean, also underground festivals like Milano Film Festival, they're there. I mean, yeah. they oh. just need probably another kind of coming together <laughs> venue yeah. or public possibility to become more visible. But lots of work has been done. I mean, and, and then you maybe see what's been done only when it's presented abroad, but yeah. it, Filmmaker it's Festival. There. Filmmaker Festival is a historical, very good festival of experimental cinema. And in the last year has a very strong section of crossover between contemporary art and cinema. Actually, their, uh, their festival, there is not probably a place, also because Milanians who have a lot of very nice and very interesting essay, movie, movie, movie theater that uh, closed little by little. So it's actually, uh, now there is some independent group of people who took, who took uh, some uh, little, little cinemas like uh, Santa Maria Beltrade and they're running a very interesting, very experimental program. So it's little things are starting to happen again. But speaking about, because you mentioned movies, I mean, I'm, I'm saying something a little different, but think how when Stefano mentioned I Am The Love, I don't know if you guys saw this great movie with Tilda Sw Swinton by an Italian director. I mean, the image of the city of Milano in the, in the, in the movies from like the 60s was the foggy working city, you know, even earlier, it was not really. And now we have, you know, directors that 
you know, set the, 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 the movie Milano and, and they reveal an incredible, an incredible city. So yeah. I think that, you know, tells something as well. I was thinking about Rocco and his brother, for example, who quote a very popular, uh, you know, the, where, where the city was perceived as gray and, you know, the, the, the city of business, not the city of aesthetics. It was yeah, but there is also something like Milan doesn't look intimidating to artists. Like the, it's not like Rome that, you know, it's right. like a total location where you typically would have the palazzos and like the exhibition inside of the palazzos and like maybe, in, you know, some historical references. Like Milan has a look that is very chic, I guess now, yeah. but um, it's, it's something that is still grounded in like our understanding of modernity and reality. So the artists can kind of like, you know, be chill about it. I think there's it. also huge, huge parts which are out of the city centre, <laughs> which yeah. are very roughly urban. And they're interesting too for young filmmakers yeah. and have been but working a lot what, in this direction. So This is what Alberto Garutti always says. That like Alberto Garutti is an artist that is showing here at Parkour with actually a project which was produced by the Fondazione Zegna and curated by Barbara. And a very consequential teacher for like a generation yes, of artists. Yes, and really like important teacher for many artists that you know now like from Paola Pivi to Giuseppe Gabellone. And he always says, I need a little bit of ugliness to start having my, my imagination going on. Otherwise, if I would like uh, just in front of a Baroque or archaeological background, I would not have the space to imagine. So, I mean, it's a little bit of ugliness sometimes it helps, maybe. I think we are really, really over time. Let's so. embrace the ugliness. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for so much. Thanks. Thank you.